Hi guys, it is a hot, sticky day here in South Austin, Texas, where we miraculously have made it as a planet one more day. We now find ourselves muddling through Sunday, June 2nd, 2013, uh, as Lily Lou, hush, Lily, come here, uh, as Lily Lou harasses the wildlife in uh, in this peaceful backyard in suburbia. I am coming to you on this sticky Sunday morning from my uh, doomsday pulpit. I just love my this doomsday pulpit. My made in China USA American flag chair uh, which I'm sure was bought at Walmart and uh, just an absolute perfect for my second Sunday in a row doomsday pulpit. This chair that I am sitting in is the poster child of everything that is wrong with this planet. This chair is killing this planet. So with, with, with my red, white, and blue doomsday pulpit, I am coming to you with my normal a Sunday morning normal, there you go, my regular Sunday morning doomsday sermon. Last week I was here uh, with, my sermon was from Wendell Berry, uh, talking about uh, these hypocritical Christians destroying creation with a capital C. And so this Sunday is kind of is my follow-up Doomsday Sermon with yet another one of my Humpty Dumpty tribe heroes. Not quite to the level of Wendell Berry, but almost my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero, Edward O. Wilson. You probably know the name. If you don't know, uh, E.O. Wilson, there's a million YouTubes on him. So anyway, this little book, he's written, I think, like 20 or 30 books. This little book takes about three hours to read from cover to cover, simply called The Creation, An Appeal to Save Life on Earth. He gets right to the point, and the, and the setup for this little jewel of a book, this little Bible of the Apocalypse, is what he is doing is the former, the former hardcore Southern Baptist Christian, Edward O. Wilson, he has fallen out of the fold after he pulled his head out of his ass and uh, he abandoned uh, Christianity for reality. But what this book is, is he is writing a letter to a pastor, I, assuming a Southern Baptist pastor, in which he is appealing to all of the preachers, I guess, in not just Christianity, but all religions, to take the impending collapse of this planet, the death of creation with a capital C, which was the subject of my sermon last week, and, and talking directly, appealing to preachers to climb on board to save creation. And so uh, I am going to dive in and read you some selected passages from this Bible of the Apocalypse starting at the very opening. Letter to a Southern Baptist pastor. Uh, Dear Pastor, we have not met, yet I feel I know you well enough to call you friend. First of all, we grew up in the same faith. As a boy, I too answered the altar call. I too went under the water. Although I no longer belong to that faith, I am confident that if we met and spoke privately of our deepest beliefs, it would be in a spirit of mutual respect and good will. I know we share many precepts of moral behavior, which is what uh, it all boils down to. Saving the planet is, is an exercise of moral behavior. 
Okay, uh, then he uh, talks about their differences. Uh, he describes himself here as a secular humanist. Uh, so does this difference in worldview separate us in all things? It does not. You and I and every other human being strive for the same imperatives of security, freedom of choice, personal dignity, and a cause to believe in that is larger than ourselves. Now, I could start debating uh, Edward O. Wilson uh, on some of his points, but this is not a debate. This is Edward O. Wilson's sermon. Uh, Let's see. Let us see then if we can and you are willing to meet on the near side of metaphysics in order to deal with the real world that we share. I put it this way because you have the power to help solve a great problem about which I care deeply. I hope you have the same concern. I suggest that we set aside our differences in order to save the creation with a capital C. The defense of living nature is a universal value. It does not rise from, nor does it promote, any religious or ideological dogma. Rather, it serves without discrimination the interests of all of humanity. Pastor, we need your help. The creation, living nature, is in deep trouble. Scientists estimate that if habitat conversion and other destructive human activities continue at their present rates, Half the species of plants and animals on Earth could be either gone or at least fated for early extinction by the end of this century. A full quarter will drop to this level during the next 50 years as a result of climate change alone. Uh, if this extinction rise continues unabated, the cost to humanity in wealth, environmental security, and quality of life will be catastrophic. Surely we can agree that each species is a masterpiece of biology and well worth saving. Each species possesses a unique combination of genetic traits that fits it more or less precisely to a particular part of the environment. Prudence alone dictates that we act quickly to prevent the extinction of species and with it the pauperization of Earth's ecosystems, hence of creation which is uh, nothing more or less than the sum of Earth's ecosystems. You may well ask at this point, why me? Because religion and science are the two most powerful forces in the world today, especially in the United States. Again, uh, this is not uh, time for Hambone Littletail to debate uh, the intellectual giant uh, Edward O. Wilson on whether or not religion and science are the two most powerful forces in the world today. Uh, so I'm going to bite my tongue here and continue on because this is E.O. Wilson's sermon, not mine. All right, so if religion and science could be united on the common ground of biological conservation, the problem would soon be solved. Again, guys, I'm biting my tongue here. 
but uh, going along with his sermon, if there is any moral precept shared by people of all beliefs, it is that we owe ourselves and future generations a beautiful, rich, and healthful environment. Okay, so from there we're going to uh, book two here, Ascending to Nature, and he's talking about the biblical uh, story in Genesis about humankind being uh, evicted from the Garden of Eden, where he takes issue with Genesis, uh, saying that we were not driven from the Garden of Eden. Uh, instead, we destroyed most of it, most of the Garden of Eden, in, or in order to improve our lives and generate more people, the dictum of going forth and multiplying. Billions of more people, in fact, to the peril of the creation with cap of the capital C. This dictum of going forth and multiplying is more than anything else behind everything else that is destroying creation with a capital of capital C. Whether you think it was created by the uh, by the hand of God or the whisper of Mother Nature. Anyway, I would like to offer the following explanation of the human dilemma. Okay, so here is Edward O. Wilson's explanation of the human dilemma. According to archaeological evidence, we strayed from nature, or we left the Garden of Eden, with the beginning of civilization roughly 10,000 years ago. That quantum leap beguiled us with an illusion of freedom from the world that had given us birth. It nourished the belief that the human spirit can be molded into something new to fit changes in the environment and culture. As a re as an, and as a result, the timetables of history desynchronized. There you go. Well, uh, hallelujah, brother. Amen, brother uh, and brother uh, Edward. A wiser intelligence might now truthfully say of humanity at this point. Here is a chimera, a new and very odd species come shambling into our universe. A mix of Stone Age emotion, medieval self-image, and godlike technology. The combination of these makes this species unresponsive to the forces that count most for its own long-term survival. There you go. This is a spot-on analysis as any as, I, as I've, I've ever read. That, that, that is the human dilemma. There seems to be no better way to explain why so many smart people remain passive while the precious remnants of our natural world disappear. They are evidently unaware that ecological surfaces provided scot-free <coughs> by wild environments, by Eden, are approximately equal in the dollar value to the entire gross world product. They choose to remain innocent, meaning they choose to remain ignorant with their head up their ass in the bliss of ignorance of the historical principle, principle that civilizations collapse 
when their environments are ruined. Apparently, they remain innocent of this historic, historical principle. Most troubling of all, our leaders, our political leaders, including those of the great religions, have done little to protect the living world in the midst of its sharp decline. This was the subject of last week's Sunday sermon by Wendell Berry. They have ignored the command of the Abrahamic God on the fourth day of the world's birth to, quote, let the waters teem with countless living creatures and let birds fly over the land across the vault of heaven. I hesitate to introduce a beautiful subject with an animadversion. I love that word, animadversion. Few will deny, however, that the human impact on the natural environment is accelerating and makes a frightening picture. What are we to do about it? At the very least, has put together an honest history, one of which people of many faiths can in principle agree. If such can be fashioned, it will at least, uh, it will serve at least as a prologue to a safer future. We can begin with the key discovery of green history. Civilization was purchased by the betrayal of nature. The Neolithic Revolution, comprising the invention of agriculture in villages, fed on nature's bounty. And the, the forward leap from that was a blessing for humanity. Uh, yes, it was. Those who have lived among hunter-gatherers will tell you they are not societies at all to be envied. But the revolution encouraged the false assumption that a tiny selection of domesticated plants and animals can support human expansion indefinitely. The pauperization of Earth's animals and plants was an acceptable price to pay until recent centuries when nature seemed all but inf infinite and an enemy to explorers and pioneers. The wilderness and the aboriginals surviving were there to be pushed back and eventually replaced in the name of progress and in the name of the gods too, lest we forget. History now teaches us a different lesson, but only to those few who will listen to the lesson of history. Even if the rest of life is counted of no value beyond the satisfaction of human bodily needs, the obliteration of nature with a capital N is a dangerous strategy. For one thing, we have become a species specialized to eat the seeds of four kinds of grasses. If these fail from disease or climate change, we too shall fail. Uh, even uh, if one insists on being thoroughly practical about the matter, 
allowing these and the rest of wild species to exist should be considered part of a portfolio of long-term investment, meaning a long-term investment for human survival. Even the most recalcitrant people must come to view conservation as simple prudence in the management of Earth's natural economy. This is what Wendell Berry talks about at length. Uh, yet few of us uh, have begun to think that way at all all. Meanwhile, the modern techno-scientific revolution, including especially the great leap forward of computer-based information technology, has betrayed nature a second time by fostering the belief, the false belief, that cocoons of urban and suburban material life are sufficient for human fulfillment. That is an especially serious mistake. Granted, many people seem to con seem content to live entirely within their synthetic ecosystems. So are domestic animals content, even in their grotesquely abnormal habitats in which we rear them. This, in my mind, is a perversion. It is not the nature of human beings to be cattle in glorified feedlots. Amen, uh, Brother Edward. We have a long way to go to make peace with this planet and with each other. We took a wrong turn when we launched the Neolithic Revolution. We have been trying ever since to ascend from nature instead of ascending to nature nature. Uh, part of the dilemma is that while most people around the world care about the natural environment, they don't know anymore why they care or why they should feel responsible for it. And this, you know, goes on to, uh, and so we will jump to the chapter why care? Uh, why care? Or we find this paragraph. The destructive power of Homo sapiens has no limit. Even though our biomass is almost invisibly small, it is mathematically possible as uh, as Alex Jones is always uh, talking about from an from a completely different uh, for a completely different reason, it is mathematically math mathematically possible to log stack all of these well these seven billion people on Earth into a single block of one cubic mile and lower them out of sight in one remote part of the Grand Canyon. Yet humanity is already the first species in the history of life to become a geophysical force. We have all by our pi bipedal wobbly headed little selves altered Earth's atmosphere and climate away from the norm. We have spread thousands of toxic chemicals worldwide, appropriated 40% of the solar energy available for photosynthesis, converted almost all of the easily arable land, dammed most of our rivers, 
raise the planet sea levels and now in a manner likely to get everyone's attention like nothing else before it. We are close to running out of fresh water. A collateral effect of all of this frenetic activity is the continuing extinction of wild ecosystems along with the species that compose them. This also just happens to be the only human impact that is irreversible. So we will jump from there to the chapter Denial and Its Risks. Denial with a capital D. The single biggest threat facing this planet is the denial of every one of us living on this planet as to what is going on and the brick wall we are all heading into at 23,000 miles an hour. There is no solution available, I assure you, to save Earth's biodiversity other than the preservation of natural environments in reserves large enough, large enough to maintain wild populations sustainably, sustainably. Only nature can serve as a planetary arc. So here, Pastor, is a homily of my own I offer to counter that of the exceptionalist. Okay. Save the creation. Save all of it. No lesser goal is defensible. However biodiversity arose, it was not put on this planet to be erased by any one species. This is not the time, nor will there ever be a time when circumstances, ju when circumstance justifies destroying Earth's natural heritage. Proud though we are of our special status, and justifiably so, let us keep our world-changing capabilities in perspective. All that human beings can imagine, all the fantasies that we can conjure, all our games, simulations, epics, myths and histories, and yes, all of our science dwindle to little beside the full protection of our biosphere. It is true that non-human life preceded us on this planet whether by a literal day, according to Genesis, or by more than three and a half billion years, as the scientific evidence shows, it is still true that we are a latecomer. The biosphere into which humanity was born had its nature-born crises, but it was overall a beautifully balanced and functioning system, and it would have continued to be so in the absence of Homo sapiens. Even today, a diminished wild nature provides us ecosystem services such as water management, pollution control, and soil enrichment equal an economic value to all that humanity artificially generates, generates. Think of it with the smaller population that can be reached within one century and a higher and sustainable 
per capita consumption spread out evenly around the world, this planet can be paradise, but only if we also take the rest of life with us into this new vision. So it's either we reduce the population of this planet voluntarily or uh, the exact uh, uh, opposite of this is going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen. This is my rant. Now, if we don't reduce the population of our own species voluntarily over the next 100 years, Mother Nature is going to do with it. And the only question becomes uh, how many of, er of our fellow Earthlings are we going to take down with us as we bring our own population down to zero? Okay, and then I will close this rant with a selection from Chapter 10, End Game. End Game, which just so happens to be the title of uh, Derek Jensen's Bible of the Apocalypse. And this is what it's all about. The End Game. The human hammer having fallen the sixth mass extinction has begun. This spasm of permanent loss is expected if it is not abated to reach the end of Mesozoic level by the end of this century. We will then enter what poets and scientists alike may choose to call the era Mesoic era, the age of loneliness. We will have done it all on our own and conscious of what was happening while we were doing it. There you go. God's will is not to blame, is not to blame for this one, guys. God's will has nothing to do with the upcoming age of loneliness. The first five spasms took 10 million years on average to repair by natural evolution. A new 10 million year slump is unacceptable. Humanity must make a decision and we must make it right now conserve Earth's natural heritage or let future generations adjust to a biologically impoverished world. There is no way to weasel out of this choice. And uh, then he talked, knowing that some Chaotic writers have toyed with the idea of last ditch measures. Ah, that's my pit bull. Go on now, pit bull. Go on now, pit bull. I was just finishing up, so I don't even know if this camera is looking at me as I'm finishing up the last two paragraphs of this sermon. Uh, talking about all of these, these horse shit. Uh, eco-techno-utopian about, and it's all in the news, about cloning woolly mammoths and passenger pigeons. You know, good lord. Uh, passing beyond these options leaves a final one for the exemptionless to pose. Go ahead and pulverize the biosphere in the hope that scientists may someday be able to create artificial organisms, an entirely artificial species, and put them together in synthetic ecosystems. Let future generations refill, refill the niches of vanished nature with tigeroids programmed not to attack human. Synthetic 
tigers burning artificial bright in forestoids amid insectoids that neither sting nor bite. There are words appropriate for artifactual biodiversity, even when it exists only in fantasy. Desecration, corruption, abomination. All of the aforementioned default solutions have been suggested, I am sorry to say, by one writer or another. Their dreams are fatuous. This time, this is the time not for science fiction, but for common sense and the following prescription. Ecosystems and species can be saved only by understanding the unique value of each species in turn and by persuading the people who have dominion over them to serve as their stewards. And that will bring me to the close of uh, my reading from The Creation, An Appeal to Save Life on Earth by Brother Edward O. Wilson, former Christian uh, scientist who gets it. And uh, that will bring me to the end of this Sunday's Doomsday Sermon from my Made in China American flag pulpit. Bye, guys.